Hopefully they didn't have any hiccups like that um, today. But, yeah, so Pastor Ken is out. He will be in Uricon, uh for the next couple of days. So let's keep that conference in prayer that God would do a special move within uh, Europe, within those that are able to travel. Good morning. Um, you know, um, a lot of people are traveling from the States. Some are coming from different continents, Africa, uh, traveling from India, just just all types of places to be there and be with the body. So, um, wow. Let's see. Um, also, just one more frame of announcements before we get started. Uh, Wednesdays will be here, um, 7 p.m., so we invite you guys to come out for Wednesday. Uh, Saturday, uh, outreach is, is canceled this week, and we'll meet again uh, Sunday at 1030. So we welcome you guys to join us for that. Um, today, I want to talk about distractions. No, that's someone else's notes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. All right. No, so I had the opportunity this week, um, uh, James, to be on James T. Uh, uh, noonday Prayer, you know, so it was a Hot 105 um, radio station, a secular radio station. Uh, they, they, they reached out to, to me, and, man, I don't even know how, why, how. <laughs> like, we're a small little church, and yet God gives us opportunity to be there and to be on the radio station and to... Um, be able to lift up South Florida for 60, 60 seconds right in prayer. What an amazing opportunity just to be able to bring forth God um, throughout the radio waves, right, and, and to proclaim that he is good. And they usually give me a, a, a theme to, to pray on. And this time it was to pray um, that we, were, we would be able to trust God with all of our heart. Um, you know, and just just praying that I looked throughout various scriptures and saw how God not only wants us to trust him with all of our heart, but he also proclaims and he proclaimed to um, the Pharisees and Sadducees. Right. When they they wanted to catch him up into to um, into a, some kind of like hard, difficult answer. Right. They said, hey, what is the greatest commandment? Like, you know, sum it up for us. Tell us what that is. And. And, and Jesus answered, and he says, God is one, and, and, and we need to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and all of our strength. And, and, and I was just thinking of that commandment, and I was thinking of the audience. You know, it's important that we, we, we think of Scripture and we look at it, and we're like, who is God talking to? So he's talking to Pharisees in that time that, that were very religious. They, they, that's all that they did. They went to school to learn religion. They studied God. They understood God. Um, yet their problem was they were doing it a lot in the flesh. You know, they were doing it in their knowledge of him, but they weren't doing it in their love for him. So God is saying, I want you to love me. I want you to love God with everything that you have, with all that you have. And, and what that should have done to them is they should have pricked their heart and said, this is impossible that I'm unable to do this, that I'm incapable of being able to do this. Like, to love God, this is far beyond my capability to actually love God with everything and all that I have. And this should have uh, caused them to weep and to say, we need a Savior. It should have caused them to weep and realize that, wow, I'm incapable of following just this one commandment. And if I'm guilty of this one commandment, I'm guilty of them all. And if I'm guilty of them all, then I'm, I'm utterly doomed to total separation from God for all my life. And it should prick our hearts today with that same conviction that we're incapable, unable, um, that we're, we, we, don't, we can't do this for one minute. We can't do this for one second. We can't do this for one hour. We can't do it at all. Like we should at, be at our feet before a holy God and be in repentance before him for this inability to be able to even love him. The one that has loved us to the uttermost, we're unable to love him back. Wasn't this what Peter said, right? When, when Jesus said, do you love me? And Peter's like, yeah, I really like you a lot. And he's like, wait, hold up. 
You deny me three times. I told you you're going to deny me three times. Do you love me? I'm trying to restore relationship with you. You know, I really like you a lot. Hey, you don't understand this. I have loved you. I died for you on the cross. And, and I'm here and I'm present. And I'm trying to have a relationship with you in spite of everything that you have done. You're totally guilty. You're totally unworthy. You know, Jesus before told them, right? He said, if you deny me before the Father, or you deny me before men, then I will deny you before the Father. Do you love me? And he says once again, I like you a lot. This is the capacity of my love for you. It's only a, I'm only able to like you to this amount. I'm incapable, unable, no matter how much you have loved me. No matter how great your grace has been towards me. No matter how merciful you have been. I'm unable to love you the way that you love me. Wow, this is uh, John, 1 John, right? Chapter 4 and 10. That, that this is love. Not that we love God first, but that he loved us. And he loves us with the unconditional, never-ending, unlavish, reckless, amazing type of love. It's a love that doesn't say, hey, you love me with everything and I'll love you. His commandment right here is, is to say, hey, I'm calling you to love me with everything, but you're not. So turn to me. See me as your Savior. See me as your God. Don't, don't make it an effort, to, an, um, an effort to do, but make it something that you're just receiving. Make it into a gift that you're receiving from me. And then here, this is what I want us to focus on. This is what I want our takeaway to be in this very short intro, is to let God love you, to let God's love strengthen you, to let God quicken you. If we read one nine, uh, Psalm 119, we see over and over it's telling us to be quickened by his word, to be quickened by uh, God, but to be quickened by everything. That, like, like it's God doing the work in us in Psalm 119, but it's also found that, that, that we are strengthened by God, that he's the one that strengthens us. He's the one that then when it's impossible, when we're totally weak, when we're incapable of doing it, he's the one that gives us the strength to be able to do it. I don't know about you, but, but I have been, I don't know, it seems, and it's not the daylight savings or whatever this is. It's not that, we're sa like, that we lost an hour, but I have been tired. I have been tired. Like, I have been weary. I have, I have been, like, on the weekends, on Saturdays, I've been sleeping a little bit longer, a little bit more tired than I normally am, and I don't know what it is. It's not because of my diet. It's not because of, of my lack of exercise, but there's something deeper than the physical that's really draining. And I don't know about you, but I, 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 we need to be strengthened by God. We need to be wakened up by God and his amazing love for us. And that love draw us into amazing things. So let's look at a few scriptures before we end. Let's go to Romans chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. And I don't want to be long-winded here, but it says, about Abraham, it says, it says, it says this. It says, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith and gave glory to God. I just love that. Like, like Abraham received the promise. He was a hundred and something years old. God promised that he was going to have a son, that he was going to have a child. He took this promise from God and it strengthened his faith. And he gave glory to God. So, so God has given us many promises. In fact, he lo loads us with, with uh, promises and blessings every single day. His word is filled with them. So be strengthened by his word and by his promise. So we're strengthened in the faith. We're strengthened in the faith by his promise. Uh, number two, uh, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And verse number one. And it says, first of all, then, I urge you, 
I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. That may be awesome. All right, I don't know. All right, uh, 11. It's all good. Um, let's go to 1 Timothy 1 and 13. Let's go up a little bit over there. And, and Paul saying, though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I receive mercy because I have acted ignorantly in unbelief. I'm strengthened by the grace of God. I'm strengthened by God's grace. Like I, I once was a blasphemer. I once was a lot of things, but I have received mercy. I have received grace. So I'm strengthened by the, the grace of God. Um, in 2 Timothy 4 and 17 But the Lord stood to me or by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. I've been strengthened so I can tell the message of Jesus Christ. I've been strengthened by God to speak of his amazing love that all may believe. Matthew uh, 28, right? It, it tells us this. It says that that all authority has been given to to me that you would go and make disciples, right? And then um, let's go one more verse as, as we con conclude. We have been strengthened. We have been strengthened for every situation. Um, let's go to Philippians 4 and verse 11. And it says, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained this and that I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. And then, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it. On my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lays behind me and straining to what lays ahead. I press towards the goal that is the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We have such amazing promise that's found in Jesus Christ. We have the most amazing promise that is found to him, and we press towards that goal. Sometimes we press crawling sometimes we press knowing that we don't have that much strength but we press we press because we're no longer ourselves we're no longer our own but we have been bought with the most precious uh cost uh with the most precious gift and, and we 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 strive in maybe on a sunday we strive in on a saturday we strive in our day-to-day -day life not in our own strength we, we really, like if we're honest, we, we, we come broken to be mended. We come hurt, we come weak, we come wounded, we come with all these different things. And yet in spite of all that and whatever can be said about us, we come the most loved, we come the most forgiven, we come the most uh, grace-filled because our God loves us. So as we get ready for the message today, turn to your neighbor, say, God loves you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Turn to someone else and say, God loves you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Say, God really, really loves you. And there's nothing you can do about it. So just let God love you. Let him strengthen you today. And let's, let's, let's welcome up Brian. He's coming with an amazing portion today. Again, Wednesday we'll see you at 7 p.m. Uh, no, no outreach on Saturday. Sunday, we'll be here at 1030. God bless you guys.
Thanks, Keith. I need to have some of that energy. I don't wake up like he says he's tired. He didn't seem tired at all to me. <laughs> uh, today we started we started off with some with some bad news, and uh, I think that's going to kind of feed into what what uh, my message is about today because started kind of the same way last week. <laughs> so uh, obviously you noticed that there was no no uh, Kelly here today. That's a little nerve wracking for uh, for me. <laughs> so I like to sit back there and hide from everybody. I still get to get my voice out here, but but I'm not. Uh, I don't like to stand in front of the, the the camera, so my nerves were shaking. I was up there shaking as we were singing, and then then when I got up here and we gave it to God, I just, everything was calm, and it was just it was beautiful. Yeah. Last week we came in. It was a very strange week for us. So we uh, we got to church about 15 minutes earlier than we usually do, and that's just it doesn't happen. Stephanie's like, "Hey, I'm ready to go. Are you ready?" I'm like. You sure? Okay, let's go. We got here. We're early. We open up the computers. Both the computers need an update. I'm like, well, that's a, that's that's no big deal. We got an extra 15 minutes. We click OK. Move on. So the f- computer she uses, the gorgeous wife up there, it uh, updates done about one minute, no problem. Moves right along. The other one's taking a little bit longer, but I don't need that one till service anyway. Pastor comes in. That's when I find out he's not going to be here this week, and he's asked me to come up here. And I accept it, obviously, because I'm here, right? <laughs> well, I immediately pray for a message, but I'm not really too concerned about it because I feel like God's been laying one on my heart already. Turns out that's not the one he's going to have me talk to you about today. But uh, went about my my, uh, my day, went up there, and we started practice. Pastor got his, his uh, piano here set up. And uh, look at the computer, and it's at 1%. So I'm like, hmm, well, that's going to be tough. 1% right now, I'm doing calculations in my head. Is it going to make it? And I'm like, it doesn't look like it. As we're singing a few songs, 2%. And then 3%. And it's just putzing along. And I'm getting nervous because that's what we do Facebook Live off of. So I don't really need it till service because we're not doing anything live yet. But then we get to the end of song service, and right before the end of song service, it jumps from five to twenty percent, and I'm I'm calming back down, like we're okay. Then it sits for a while, and it's twenty-one percent, and it's starting to do the whole thing over again. I'm getting nervous now, so I start to find a way to get around it. Let's take it. Let's shift Facebook Live to the other computer, the one that is working. Plug it in and do do a quick test of it just to make sure it's working. And the sounds coming out of that thing, I tell you what. You ever you ever drove driving along the highway and one of your kids rolls down the back window and it's the only window open? You know what that does to the car? Starts vibrating through the that's that's what was coming out of that computer. <laughs> and I'm I'm telling you that was just I'm like, what's going on? At this point, I'm praying over the computers. But I'm nervous because in Jesus' time, there were no computers. I don't know if God knows how to fix a computer. (laughs) But as we get closer to service, it does start to speed up. Um, It gets to about 80% just before service. So I know worship service is not going to be part of Facebook Live today today on that one. And I've let that go. And that's a little bit strange for me. Usually if there's a problem with a computer... I can't let it go. It's in my head. I'm trying to figure out how can I fix this. Well, I've realized there's nothing I can do for this right now. I can't fix it. God, this is on you. So other than Christy texting me and asking me what I did wrong to make Facebook Live not come up, (laughs) I was letting it go. (laughs) But I focused on the one thing I could do, and that was worship. So I don't know if it was just me, and actually now I'm pretty sure it wasn't just me, but um, when we came here on Wednesday, Cindy had mentioned it as well, but last week's worship was amazing. I don't know if you guys felt it. I felt it. And again, I, I, at the time, I thought maybe it was just me because I was finally fully focused on worship. I wasn't thinking about Facebook Live. I wasn't thinking about anything else. I was giving it all to him. And uh, I knew right away God screwed up my computer. <laughs> But he did it 
because he wanted me to focus. So odd thing is, that's just not me, you know? I'm not, I can focus on one thing, that's it. God knows that. So he's going to make me focus on the thing I need to. Worship service ended, and it hits 100%. Praise the Lord, right? And then it restarts the computer, because that's what it does, right? <laughs> Steve-O comes up here, gives a great word. Sorry, Christy, Steve-O's word was not for you. But he comes up here, and he gives his word, and it's restarting, and it comes up, and right as he's finishing it, his word, the computer's ready to go. I start up Facebook Live, and immediately, pastor walks up here. God's timing. We think it's late, but he did something with that. And I know why. I prayed for a sermon. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> like I said, the first thing that came to mind was not what he wanted me to talk about. And God made it clear that that wasn't it when I tried to, when I tried to create that sermon. He blocked me at every path. Everything I looked up, that's not it. That's not it. So I said, what is it then? You've got to give it to me. That's when he reminded me. I gave it to you right after you asked me for it. Don't let anything distract you from me. Let's turn to Hebrews 12.1, please. Wherefore, seeing... We are also compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin that does easily beset or distract us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So many have run this race before us. Hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Everyone who's already done this is looking back, and they're laughing. Why was I so concerned with these little things? Why did I let these things distract me from you? See, there's a path God set right in front of us, straight and narrow. I can look straight down it. That's where I'm supposed to go. But somebody did something over here. I want to check that out. Something's going on over here. Let's go over there. I'm running back and forth. I'm jumping over the barricade. It's not the right way to go. And we're learning from it. These, these uh, distractions, things like money, the news, social media, even church, sports, Video games, our phones, personal relationships, routines, daily responsibilities, worries, work, and all kinds of entertainment. All these things constantly distract us from God and the race he wants for us. See, in verse 2, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne. Jesus showed us how to run the race. He did it in 33 years. Usually takes us a little longer, right? But he could see the joy that was set before him, the joy that his, what he's doing as a result. He went through torture and shame and death just to do the will of God. It wasn't just death. He was executed, but he was executed in a gruesome way. He didn't really want to do it in his like in his in his in the natural man. Like he was he's not a natural man, but he still struggled with that. He prayed over it. How incredible does the joy that God gives you have to be to be worth that? See, I think most of us don't get how good the joy of the Lord is. Maybe we haven't experienced it, or maybe we experienced it so quickly that we thought that's just one little thing. That's just that little happiness we get when we get something. But the joy of the Lord, for the joy of the Lord, people are willing to walk into a fiery furnace instead of worshiping another God. For the joy of the Lord, people are thrown into a lion's den and they end up with some new little kitty friends. I don't know why, but every time I think of Daniel in the lion's den, I think of him in there curled up with these cats, petting them, <laughs> He's got one of them as a pillow. That's how I view that. And it's, <laughs> some reason, that's how I view that, that situation. But Because I feel like God's comforting him. Not just He's not just in there struggling and worried about it. He's comforted the whole time he's in there. But there's so many stories where people are willing to lay down their lives just 
to stay in the will of God. And it's not just because they're afraid of God. There's something to it. It's they have, a, they have a personal relationship with him. They know what it means to have his joy. They've received it, and they don't ever want to lose it. So why is it so hard for us to give up something little for that joy? The things he's asking of us are minuscule to what these people have been asked to do. We're so afraid to lose something that we don't need to get the one thing we really do. We know the joy of the Lord is our strength. Why do we get distracted so easily? It's easier to be distracted than to be focused. You have to be intentional to be focused. If I'm talking to you, Keith, I'm looking at you in the eye, and someone walks in the room, instantly I'm doing this. That's how easily distracted we are. If he starts to talk over here and, I'm th- and you're talking to me, I got nothing. I'm not hearing anything. So distracted. So much easier to be distracted than focused. And a lot of those distractions are fun, right? We want to be distracted. We get bored. So we're looking for what's going to take care of that. The more we do it, the more we think that we need that distraction now. Without that, their direct, or without that distraction, we're lost. We don't have direction. So let's talk about some of the distractions. Not all distractions are sin. All sin is a distraction. But So some of these things I'm going to talk about, they're not necessarily sins by themselves, but you can let them become sins. First one is money. See, money's not just a want. It is a need in, in this society. We need it to survive. But God knows how much you need. And he also knows how much you just want. God's going to provide all your needs. And there's no reason to obsess with those. He's already got it covered. See, as soon as we start seeking money or things more than we seek God, that's become a distraction. Matthew 6.19 tells us just the value of money here on earth. Lay not up yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust corrupts, where thieves break through and steal. See, everything we have here on earth is temporary. Any of it can be taken from us at a moment's notice. Anything you have in your your home right now might not be there when you get home. It can be taken away and nobody can get it back for you. None of it brings joy. None of it's going to give you even more than a temporary sense of happiness. And that's why Jesus continues in verse 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust corrupts, and where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Treasures in heaven. For most people, we might get 80 years here on earth. And those that have accepted Jesus get eternity in heaven. Those that don't get eternity somewhere else. The treasures in heaven can't be taken from you. They're being put in your home right there right now, and nobody can get in to take them. They're yours. And you won't want anything else for all of eternity. The treasures on earth, you don't even want a few months after you got them. You all of a sudden, you want something else, and then something else, over and over until you die. And then all you have left is whatever you send to heaven. See, the things of this world are completely worthless. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. If your heart's in the world, that's what you're seeking. You're not seeking God. You wonder why you don't have any peace or joy. Well, you got your eyes on the wrong things. You need to get your eyes off of money. On to God, or you'll never be satisfied. We're missing our joy in the pursuit of money. Next distraction is media. This one's tough. God convicted me on this one about three years ago. I'm sure you know a lot of things were going on about three years ago. And I was a bit of an online tyrant. The news made me mad. The comments about the news made me mad. The comments about my comments made me mad. (laughs) So I kept commenting because I had to prove them wrong, right? (laughs) All this time, all the things I was mad about, they didn't matter. 
all things work together for his good. I wasn't changing anybody's mind. They definitely weren't changing mine. See, our church at that time asked everyone to go on a 21-day fast from whatever's hindering you from God. Mine was obvious. I think my wife on the way home said, you know what you need to give up, right? (laughs) But I realized quickly that uh, if my eyes are on God, the things of the world are growing strangely dim. Those things that I was worried about and thinking so much about didn't matter. God had them right where he wanted them. See, if I see a a news story now, I turn it off. If I see something that's getting to me, and I'm getting upset about it, time to get away from it. He's got it under control. He doesn't need my help to educate you guys on how wrong you are. It's like that progressive commercial, right? See, this guy's at a home improvement store, and he's talking to another customer. And the doctor who's trying to help him not be like his parents says, did he ask for your help? No, no, he did not. See, (laughs) we are here to show his love, not spread more anger. Don't let the news or social media rob you of your joy. Now, church, church can be a distraction. It's a very tough one to bring up here, but it's going to be some words that may speak to somebody here. Maybe they won't. Maybe something else here is for you. But church can be a hindrance to God if we don't come here with the right heart, if we're not looking with his eyes. We can let it take our focus off God if we forget our purpose here. We're here to encourage one another. Pick each other up when we fall, not talk about the fall, not talk about each other. See, we think we have to be perfect here. It should be exactly the opposite. I should be able to come to Keith and say, Keith, I'm really struggling with this and feel loved and and encouraged and helped past it. See, we need to feel safe in this building. We need to be safe to be sinners because otherwise nobody's welcome here. We all need Dr. Jesus. See, after being drugged through the mud for all week, maybe half a week, preferably half a week, we need something here to bring us back. In John 3, 17, God tells us why he sent his son. Not, he sent his son not into the world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus went right up to the sinners and talked to them. He loved them. He never went back and talked to James and John about what these people were doing. Never accused the sinners of a single thing. He just showed them love. And, then, and they felt unlovable. They felt like they couldn't come to Jesus. And he showed them, I will come to you. Then when they were ready to hear it, that's when he said, sin no more. And he did it in complete love. We're supposed to be like him. These things should not exist here. We are in no place to say anyone is below us. We are the lowest of the low. When we talk about other sins behind their back, we are publicly doing what they did in private. We aren't even ashamed of our sin at that point. And we should know better. Make this a safe place for sinners. The consequences of not doing so are twofold. Now we're distracted by a different sinner because you're also a sinner. And then we miss what God's speaking here because we're thinking about this other person. And that person also might miss God because they feel judged. It's a very dangerous and slippery slope we play. As Christians, we expect to not to be accepted in the world. And if we're not accepted here, where can we turn? Jesus paid much too high a price for us to pick and choose who gets to come. Nobody is too far gone to come to Christ, and this is the perfect place to come and experience his peace and joy. Don't let your failures or others' failures take you from that joy. Next one. Now this, one's, this one's my new one. I'm a little bit past social media for the most part. I still got some issues there. Our phones. Woo. That one is my deadly weapon against myself. The ultimate distraction. 
It's an incredible tool. See, I can accomplish a million things on my phone. I need it every day in my right pocket. It brings me food if I want to. It can take me anywhere I want to go. It's my Bible. It's my job. It's my calculator, a computer. It's my TV. It transports me instantly to my family and friends anytime I need to talk to them. But in the meantime, it can cause me to miss God. I tend to use this whenever I'm bored. It's an on-purpose distraction in those cases. I don't want to watch this Lifetime movie, but I still want to sit next to my wife. So I'm going to play my video games on my phone. I got to go to the bathroom. I'm going to be there a while. I'm scrolling on Facebook because I'm bored. I'm in bed, but I'm not that tired. And something is on my mind keeping me awake. I need to get rid of that worry. So I am playing on something on my phone to get past that until I forget what I was worried about. See, the devil knows this is where he can get me. He puts things on my screen that I don't want there. Those are my triggers. They're so dumb. My kids make fun of me over and over when I, when I fail to those triggers. There's things that make me lose sight of God. They make me fail. Then the algorithm of Facebook sees what I did, and it says, oh, that's what he likes. Let's give him more of that. Over and over again, my phone is flooded with things I don't want to see. Matthew 5.29 tells us exactly what to do in this instance. And if your right eye offends you, pluck it out, cast it from you, for it is profitable for you that one of your members should, not, should perish and not that your whole body be cast into hell. See, if something on your phone or something in your life is causing you to fail, you've got to cut it out of your life. That app that's, that's giving you those things, delete it. It's got to go. Anything that triggers us has got to be blocked and removed. When you're here, this is God's time. Your 100% of your focus is, needs to be on him. The volume needs to be off. Your ringer needs to be off. The notifications are off. We don't have a life outside of this building when we're in here. Give that time to God. If you're struggling in some area of your life and you feel like you don't have any answers, that's when it's time to give that time to God. Get alone in a room with no distractions. Whatever it is that, that hinders you, get rid of it. Take it to God. Make it clear to everyone that this is your time with God and you're not going to respond to an email or a phone call or a text. If you don't remove it, God might remove it for you. He's not as gentle sometimes. <laughs> Don't let your phone bring sin into your life, robbing you of peace and joy. Next one, personal relationships. This one is probably going to ruffle some feathers. Sometimes out there in the world, we have friends that may or may not be Christian. But even if they are Christian, they may not be in the same place in their walk as you are. See, this can sometimes allow us to let our guard down say or do things that we aren't necessarily comfortable with to make them more comfortable. See, we may have the best of intentions, but it's not going to give you the desired result. The more you compromise your own morals, the further you get from him. You're not pulling them closer. A quick example. I grew up in a family where curse words were forbidden, strictly forbidden. As a result, curse words make me very uncomfortable. Most people I talk to know this. They may talk, there's people I know that talk and they can't say a single sentence without them. But they have a tendency when they're talking to me to change how they talk because they can see that it makes me uncomfortable. Well, sometimes I think I'm going to try to make them feel comfortable and I'm going to slip out one of those words in my sentence because, it, you know what, it's going to be a little bit funny to say it right here and they're going to chuckle, Right? I'm going to tell you something that's never once made me any cooler. <laughs> I have to choke it out. Every time I'm about to say it, I pause, and I have to try to basically spit that word out because I don't want to say it. I'm saying it because I think it's what they want to hear. 
Like I said, I've never looked cool doing that. See, I think that these people, they, they respect where I'm at. And I need to just let them know where I'm at and stay there. See, some other personal rela- relationships are biblically talked about. You guys ever hear Paul talk about marriage? Paul, I, I think he hates marriage. I don't know. He, I, I, it's like eight times I feel like he's, he's like, don't get married, don't get married, don't get married. But he's got a reason for it. See, it's, he says it's better not to be married. There's nothing wrong with being married. As a matter of fact, I am married. I confess. <laughs> but he says it's easier, or it's better not to be married because a married person will sometimes put their spouse ahead of God. And I agree. See, it's easier to ask forgiveness from God than my wife. <laughs> and as a man, I want the easier way, right? Right, guys? High five? <laughs> I'm going to give you another confession. Sometimes, when me and my wife walk into this building, I know everybody thinks we have this perfect relationship. Sometimes we're walking into this building and we just got out of the car and we were yelling at each other and we don't even like each other right now. (laughs) But there's something about this place. We both come here with intentions of giving this time to God. And there's something magical about that. I don't know that we've ever apologized to each other in church, but somehow, when we're at church, we did. By the end of church, we're holding hands. We're rubbing a back. We know we're back. See, with with God's, with no distractions and everything focused on God, all those things, those worries, those angers, those things you were concentrating on, they're gone. They don't matter, and you realize they don't matter. See, if you bring God into all these relationships, they're going to become much stronger. In Ecclesiastes 4.12, the cord of three strands is not easily broken. If you want to bring that joy and peace into your relationships, you've got to bring God in. Put him at the forefront. The next one, and I think this is the one that probably gets most of us, routines. We get so caught up in all our daily responsibilities. I got to do the dishes. I got to do laundry. I got to sweep the floors. We got to take out the trash. I got to go to work and I got to sleep. Where in that time frame did you talk about God? There's no time left for him. I'll do that on Sunday. I'm going to lay a little truth on you guys. I've talked about a direction, about direction a lot when I come up here. And when I want clear direction from God, I can't just come to church and pray for five minutes over and expect to get an answer. Now, sometimes it works that way, but not often. See, we got to look at our relationship with God. We're his children. So when my kids were younger, they used to ask for things all the time. They wanted everything. Everything they saw on TV, everything they saw that their friends had, they wanted it all. But they only wanted it for about five minutes, most of it. So if I wanted to see what do you really want, I was, I was going to tell my kids, then you need to pay for it. And if they pursued it and they worked for it, that's when I knew. That's what they wanted. In those instances, that's when I bought it for them. That's the same with God. If, you're, if you want something, you need to pursue it. You need to be willing to work for it. You need to pray for it constantly. If you want God's direction, Five minutes on Sunday isn't going to do it. And tomorrow, bring him with you. Pray for it. Set apart time to pray for it every day. The more effort you're putting in, the more he's seeing. That's what they want. That's what they need. And he's willing to give it to me. See, so if you spend that time with him, you're going to get it. You want to hear from God regularly? You need to ask for it regularly. Your responsibilities, your routines, they're distracting you from him. 
If he's not in your schedule now, he needs to be in it. See, spending time with God is the most important part of your schedule. It's not something you do in your spare time. Pick a time every day. Make sure you're alone. Give it 100% to him. And see all the problems in your life melt away. See, make sure you fully devote it to him. Let's go to Luke 10.40. Talk about what, how God sees these responsibilities. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore to come help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. See, isn't it funny to look at it from this perspective? See, when we have visitors, my wife likes to perfectly clean the house. She wants the floor swept and mopped and everything to be spotless knowing full well that 20 people are about to walk in straight out of the mud. Nobody even notices that anything was done, and nobody cares if it was or not. They're all there for our company, and that's all God wants. He wants your company. He wants you to spend time with him. He wants you to want to spend time with him. See, in these verses, Martha's asking why are, why is is it okay for this person to just be lazy and sit here and do nothing? But see, she's seeking the good part. She's seeking what Jesus has to say because she knows that is what matters in this world. See, don't let your routines rob you of the joy that God wants to give you. Make him the most important part of your daily routine. Now work. Work goes hand in hand with routines. But to take it a little further... God needs to come with you to work. Eventually, you're going to be concerned with whatever the boss says to do or what, the, what your coworker said to you that upset you. You don't often think when you're stressed out at work, what should I do about what the boss said? Just try, like you just try and do it. See, this is another distraction. You're going to get overwhelmed at work. Your coworkers upset you, that upset you, it's going to bother you. You're not, you're not thinking about God anymore. When I start to get overwhelmed at work, I start to get this uneasy feeling right here. I'm starting to become overwhelmed. I work from home, so I found a way to work, work with that. That's the time where it's time to take my dog outside. Forget about what's going on with work. Go out and talk to God for a little bit. At your job, if you don't work from home, I'm sure you get 15, 30-minute breaks here and there. That's a great time to step away and bring it to God. Say, God, relax my, relax my soul. Calm my mind. God doesn't mind if you pray when you're on the toilet. He doesn't mind if you pray with your mouth full, as long as your mind's on him. When this becomes a part of your work day, you're going to have peace and joy at work. Now, doesn't that sound amazing? Amazing? <laughs> it's not a fairy tale, people. Don't let work rob you of your joy. Obviously, if we don't uh, recognize when there's a distraction happening, we're not going to address it. I'm going to give you a few ways that we can know when we're being distracted. God's giving us warning signs all the time. The Ten Commandments are warnings. Like I said earlier, all sin is a distraction. Not all distractions are sin, but all sin is a distraction. So, if it's against the Ten Commandments, guess what? It's a distraction, no matter what. Second Peter 2, 18 and 19, it's going to tell us what we should notice about false prophets that tempt us. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure us through lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty, 
They themselves are servants of the corruption. For whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought in bondage. That there is a warning, folks. That's some Indiana talk for you. <laughs> Satan is going to tempt you. He's, gonna show, he's not going to show up as a demon, all red skin with these horns. He's going to send a source that you trust. He's going to speak to you with these pretty words. Lust of the flesh, things you want to see, things you want to hear. He's going to promise you that these things are going to free you. But in truth, they're going to send you into bondage. If you have accepted God, you also have the Holy Spirit. And that is a way to discern those voices. In Hebrews 10, 14 to 16, let's hear what that means. In 14 here, it's talking about how you get the Holy Spirit. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those that are sanctified. Wherefore, of the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that, he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds. I will write them. See, so many warnings we've gotten in the Bible, and God's written those words on our heart. The Holy Spirit's there to help us understand them. That's, we come here because we can't understand those words necessarily on our own all the times. We study, we dive, but we listen to the Holy Spirit. See, when, when you're listening to the wrong voice, the Holy Spirit's going to convict you. You're going to feel it. You're going to know it. When I see something that I want, and I'm, I start to think, hey, let's go get it. I go to Amazon. If it's not something God wants me to have, I know right away. Get that out of my cart. Sometimes I listen, sometimes I don't. Every time I don't, I regret it. Every time. <laughs> when I'm needing to read something, or I'm reading something, and I want to respond, and I get this tug, walk away. It's not going to do what you think it's going to do. Again, sometimes I listen and sometimes I don't. When I don't, I'm always going to have to apologize. With your relationships, God wants to use you. So for me, I'm scared to death to screw those ones up. I don't want to fail God in my relationships. Because I have make it known, like I said, my standing with God. It's more important to me to make sure that those people are, are being drawn to God through my actions and my words. So I know I need to behave differently towards people around me. There's a person in my building right now that uh, doesn't like me too much right now. Not necessarily for anything that I've done, but he's perceived that I've done something. And he approached me and he gave me these wild accusations. And I did not handle it so well. See, I thought I handled it pretty good at the time. The Holy Spirit said, no, you got to make that right. I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet, but I know I need to make that right. And he's not going to let me ease off of it until I do. See, the Bible doesn't tell you exactly what to do in every situation, but the Holy Spirit can. He knows how to take the Bible and apply it right to your life, right to the one situation you need. With routines and work, that feeling of being overwhelmed or upset, the Holy Spirit is telling you, you can't handle this alone. Don't try. Bring it to God. See, I know I'm probably speaking to everyone in this room about something. God had me break it up for a reason. If you felt a tug of conviction in one area, that's your area. God wants to work on that area. He's offering a warning. This is robbing your joy. Get rid of it. I know the Holy Spirit was dealing with me when I went through certain areas. His warnings are everywhere, and they're for our good. They're there to keep us from moving in the wrong direction. But if you ignore them too much, you might not even recognize the voice anymore. Not even when he's screaming it in your ear. We've got to remi be reminded what's important. It's only God. See, another way to tell if you're distracted is if you're worried or offended. 
Those things don't happen when your eyes are on God. If you're fully focused on God, nothing anybody says or does can bother you. You know who you are in Christ. They can't accuse you of anything that bothers you because you know who you are. I'm not saying that if you're a Christian, you're never going to be offended. Clearly it happens. I just admitted it a couple of seconds ago. (laughs) But if you can be 100% focused on God, you won't be. You know why you don't know anybody who's like that? They already finished the race. What's the race? The starting point, you're born again. And the ending point, God has been has finished your faith. You're ready to move on to the next level. So correct it before it becomes a bigger problem. Give it back to the author and finisher of your faith. Your attitude about the situation can tell you. If you think you can't do something because you've got to focus on yourself, that's a distraction. You, yourself is the distraction. I can't do this. I've got this problem I've got to handle. God wants you to give those problems to him. It's time to look to others. In Philippians 2, 4, and 5, Paul writes to one of the seven churches pastors has been speaking. Well, he's about to speak about on Wednesdays. <laughs> Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Jesus Christ. Don't be focused on yourself. Don't be focused on your problems. Look to who you can help. See, Jesus gave his life for others. He didn't benefit from it. You did. Think about this. In Luke 22, 42, Jesus is praying, completely aware of what was about to happen. He's about to be arrested. He's about to be tortured. He's about to be put to death. He's praying, Father, if you would be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus had some big problems. Like I said, moments away from torture and death. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He didn't really want to go through it. But for the joy that was beset before him, it was worth it. He still asked for, his, for God's will. The greatest joy tends to come from letting go of your own problems. Focus on others. Looking for God's direction. Seek God first, and you're going to get all the things you need and then some. We're so selfish. We have such a hard time looking past what's going on in our own lives. We're so easily distracted by these little things. When I'm stressed out, I don't usually think, you know what, I should get out of this house and go see how I can help my neighbor. But imagine if that was how we all behaved. If every time we had a problem, we looked to God to take care of that problem, threw him in. God, this one's on you. God bats a thousand, and he has zero errors in his entire career. So why are we afraid to put him in? Why are we afraid to give him control? As soon as you put him in the game, you can't lose. But we have FOMO, right? FOMO, fear of missing out. (laughs) We're worried that what God has for us may cause us to miss something that we really want to do. Bad news, guys, it will. But once you give it up, you're going to realize very quickly what he has for you is so much better. I'm all in on peace and joy now. Those are the only things I truly want. If I ever feel I've lost those or I'm going to lose those, I'm willing to give up anything to get them back. The good news is God gave us a playbook. If you don't have one, I'm pretty sure we got extras here, right, Keith? So if you don't have one, go to Keith. Let's get you a Bible. It's full of perfect plays, and what's even better, that Holy Spirit. He's going to direct those plays in your life. And with that, all we have to do is focus on him and ask him for his will. Jesus even told us how to pray. As I read this, I want you to understand in Matthew 6, 9, what we're really praying when we say the Lord's Prayer. Because it's such, such a common verse, such a common prayer. 
I think that we get lost. We just say, say it because we've memorized it. We're not thinking about what we're saying. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's such a good prayer, and it's so lost on so many people. The line I want you to focus on, line at verse 10, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the line that people recite over and over and over again, and they don't really mean it. Too bad it only counts when you mean it. So you said to God, no matter what I want, I want your will to be done in that situation. You're asking God to take over your choices, and you're willing to accept the consequences. When Jesus was praying, he was actually praying for his own death. He said, if it's your will, take my life. That goes completely against human nature. All of our selfishness. That line is what keeps you focused on him. That line is what, how you recognize that his way is going to be better than yours. I urge you to incorporate that line into every prayer. I urge you to pray it often, especially when you're distracted. And I urge you even more to mean it every time you say it. Don't let distractions of this world rob you of the good part that Mary chose. Don't let it be taken from you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for these words. Can't imagine doing these without you. Lord, I just pray that in all things, everything that's going on in everyone's life, that your will will be done. Lord, direct them to seek your will. Ask them to seek you. When they want to know what to do, speak it to them as they seek it. Your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, we're going to send around the offering. I don't know if we got somebody that can handle that for us. Our normal person is Steve-O. <laughs> Lord, I thank you guys for all coming. going to trip. I didn't even realize I was doing that. <laughs> That's probably why pastor says he doesn't like the rug, right? <laughs> put, it there, put it there to not trip over the, the cords, and then instead you trip over the rug. You can go ahead. Yeah. I don't know if you mind or not. I'm not going to sing. <laughs> God bless you all. <laughs>